Hi, thank you for having me in this seminar today. Today, I will share my journey of overcoming my suicide attempt. If you're someone who is depressed and suicidal right now, if you don't want to seek treatment thinking that nothing can improve your condition, I think my presentation will give you hope that your condition will improve one day. It's how are you feeling right now is completely temporary. Uh, mental health recovery is achievable. So I, yeah, so thank you for listening. My story started from the very beginning. I was born a very neurotic, sensitive, and anxious person. Uh, this is my default expression. Um, I was born looking like this. Perhaps in 80% of my baby photos, um, I had this anxious expression stuck on my face. Uh, my parents would describe me as very hard to take care of, especially during sleep time. It would just take forever to put me to sleep. When I was a toddler, um, I was described as very shy and introverted. I would be terrified if I had to speak in class. My voice would sound like a mosquito. Yeah, this is another baby photo of mine that is very typical. I had a lot of phobias. I was afraid of all kinds of bugs, insects, spiders, rodents, you name it. The phobic feeling was very physiological in nature. I felt like my heart was beating very fast and I couldn't breathe when those panic attacks um, happened. And at the time, I really didn't know what that was. Um, I didn't know if I was any different from someone who is mental, mentally healthy. I always had a lot of mental energy. My sleep always had a bad quality. But starting from grade five, this was when I would stay awake for the entire night for no major reason. But I didn't feel like it was bothering me at the time because the next day I didn't have a headache and my energy level was unaffected. So I thought, well, maybe everybody was like that. It didn't register to me that this would be one of the early signs of mental illness. When I was 13, I left China and immigrated to Canada. This is when my mental health took a dramatic turn for the worse. Well, being a newcomer there, um, there was a lot of prejudice and discrimination, but I wouldn't say it was bullying, but I would say that the experience was very typical as a newcomer. But, but perhaps somebody, uh, somebody in the same shoes as I was, they might not care at all. Whereas for me, it would take me forever to get over a negative encounter. When I was 16, and this was when I first experienced the feeling of wanting to hurt myself, I had a suicidal feeling after having a mild dispute with a girl in my class, and I started to cry that night, and I couldn't stop crying. Then until a point where I started to feel this suicidal feeling, that really surprised me because even at that time, I knew that it was a very mild issue. It shouldn't trigger a suicidal feeling. Between 16 to 18, my mental health continued to degrade and my sleep became increasingly difficult. If I had a presentation the next day, I would be so nervous and I wouldn't be able to sleep for the entire night. Um, even if something really exciting happened during the day, then I would be unable to calm down at night. So I always had this enormous amount of mental energy. The pace of my thoughts was always very fast. I just couldn't stop thinking. And my insomnia became a regular routine for me. Um, and when I turned 18, that's when I started to see someone for the first time. Um, at that time, I was very obsessed. And, and because of various reasons, the relationship ended after just four weeks. That's when my manic depression or bipolar disorder officially started. So, it came like a storm. Insomnia was the very first troublesome symptoms. Before, before that point, my insomnia was bearable. I didn't physically suffering from it, but this time it was very different. Um, first of all, it was impossible to sleep. I couldn't even have a nap. 
Um, I just couldn't control the pace of my thoughts and they were firing like a machine gun. There was a lot of physical symptoms associated with as well. I felt like my heart was beating very fast. I had this feeling that um, I was going to die. I was, th th there, there was this phobic feeling out of nowhere. And also because um, and there was also a sense of loneliness, extreme loneliness. I couldn't sleep by myself. I have to go to my mom's bed, hold her hand to ease up my fear. It was a very real physiological feeling. Um, so this is a PET scan image showing a normal brain versus somebody who is going through an acute episode of bipolar disorder. And as you can see, for someone who has bipolar disorder, it's completely red. This is what their brain looks like. And that's how exactly how I felt like. I felt like the blood was gushing into my head. This headache was explosive. It felt like a volcano inside of my head and it was absolutely unbearable. I've seen an image of somebody who's going through a seizure and their brain is actually less red compared to somebody with bipolar disorder. So imagine if somebody is in the midst of a seizure, are you able to tell them to stop twitching? Are you able to tell them to stop having those physical symptoms? No, right? But for some reason, when someone is mentally ill, people tend to tell them to stop thinking or to control their thoughts or to think differently. This is beyond their control because their brain is physiologically sick. Therefore, it's useless when you try to counsel someone out of their mental illness or suicidal tendencies. It's simply beyond their control. So right away, I lost the ability to sense if I was hungry or if I was thirsty. I couldn't tell those signals in my brain. It's not just that I don't want to eat or drink. It's simply I don't feel like I'm hungry or I'm thirsty. I really took away those primary biological functions of a brain. However, at the time, people couldn't understand it. They thought that I wanted to kill myself because my boyfriend dumped me. Um, I wanted to die because of love, which was a very petty reason. People were kind of judgmental and there were also a lot of contempt. Uh, at the time, um, there was barely any awareness campaign on mental um, health or mental illness. And even when I went to a family doctor, they would try to talk me out of my depression. They would try to counsel me instead of treating me as a medical condition. Um, therefore, um, if you do have a serious mental illness, it's better to see, well, you must see a psychiatrist who are specially trained in the area. Family doctors um, are usually not very knowledgeable or experienced in treating a, um, somebody who is at the point of uh, suicide. So um, the first step in suicide prevention, if you want to see a psychiatrist ASAP, then it's better to go to an emergency room in the hospital. So anyway, um, my family doctor tried to get me sleeping pills for my insomnia, but however, now I know that if somebody has insomnia as a result of a mental illness, sleeping pills are useless. Um, they are supposed to be medicated with psychotropic medications, and those medications are the key to restoring their sleep. So for me, three weeks without any sleep, that's when the suicidal feelings became constant. And with every car that drove towards me, I had this strong impulse of jumping in front of it. Every time using the subway system, I would just fantasize about jumping off the track. Literally 24 seven, I was Googling for different ways that people committed suicide. I was Googling for easier way to commit suicide, which is actually a very popular Google search items because many suicidals, though they want to die, but um, they might be afraid of dying. Yeah, so anyway, 24 seven, that was the only thing in my mind. That was the only thing I wanted to do. Um, it was absolutely consuming. I couldn't control those impulses from overtaking me. It was simply, not within my willpower to overcoming those uh, suicidal feelings. The very first attempt I did was overdosing myself on medication. I took about 60 pills and I actually woke up the next day because the sleeping pills 
were very mild. It didn't kill me at all. I was、uh, able to wake up naturally. I got sent to a psychiatric ward.、Um, when I was in psychiatry, the doctor did prescribe me antidepressants. However, perhaps perhaps I was too crazy to understand anything. But I don't. I remember he ever told me about the importance of taking medication. Or staying on medication because for any type of psychotropic medication, it would take at least three weeks to kick in. This is why most people are、um, who don't have faith in medication because they can't wait for medication to be effective. It, it takes time for medication to actually、uh, work it out. So it's very important that you stay on the medication until it's taken its effectiveness. Um, I went home after just three days in the hospital. Normally, if you're in a psychiatric facility, it's better to stay there for at least two or two, two or three weeks before the medication kicks in. It's better that you stay there and you're protected and you're monitored. However, I think my parents that they were just so worried. They wanted me home because they couldn't stand me in a psych ward, and they were. Afraid that I would be affected by other patients, and they and and I would become equally insane. So all of those stigmas and misconceptions about a psychiatric facility really prevented me from accessing the right type of help and treatment. So after I went home again, people around me keep on saying, "You don't need medication. Those medications are having so much side effects. It's gonna mess you up even more. You just have to be strong. You can do it." So, I all of those useless talks just make me feel like, well, is it because I'm a weak person that I can't come out of this?、Um, I feel like it's my fault that I'm in this state, and I knew so well that there was nothing I could personally do to make it better. It's it's not something that is is nothing I can do to make it better because it's a biological need to die. It was more powerful. Than our need for food and water, it's like somebody who is missing in the desert for a few days, and all they can think about is food and water. This is what suicidal feeling feels like. All you could think about is planning your suicide and fantasizing about different ways to die. During my latter days, I couldn't even feel if I wanted to go to the bathroom. I couldn't even sense if I want to pee. It's it was a complete debilitation. Of my brain, so 2003 was the time of the SARS outbreak, and after not sleeping for two months, I looked very sick. Anybody could tell that there was something wrong with me, because I'm Asian, and everybody thought that I had SARS. When I went out, they wanted to fly away from my presence. Seeing their reaction made me feel like I would never recover.、Um, I felt like I would never become a normal person again. So that was my last straw. The fact that I didn't have hope that this would be a treatable condition、uh, was the reason why I wanted to end my life. I didn't have any knowledge about mental illness. I didn't have a seminar like this at the time. I had no peer support. Not having hope was why I wanted to die. I had to die. During my most terrible period, I even thought about hurting my parents because, first of all, I was not capable of loving them anymore. I didn't have any of those primary emotions as a human being. I don't care about their suffering. I don't care that they are devastated. I don't care if they can't live without me. I hate them for bringing me into this world. I hate them for giving me life. I'm not sure how many people here are actually. Feeling the same way,、um, you are blaming your parents for the same thing, and you are abusing them with words. You're saying really mean things to them because you hate them for giving you life.、Um, if you have parents like mine, they would die for you. They would die to take your place. They would die to take away your suffering. So don't do that to them. Don't hurt them, and don't try to leave them because. They love you so much. However, at the time, I actually even thought about killing my parents because they were so protected. I thought that if I don't get rid of them first, I would never be able to kill myself. I would do anything to kill myself, including killing my parents.
Now that when I see incidents of gun violence or massacres where the gunmen ended up dead, it's actually because they are suicidal in the first place. The motive is not because they want to vent, but if the gunman ended up dead, that's because they wanted to commit suicide in the first place. Killing oneself requires a lot of guts and requires a lot of commitment. And it's usually very hard to do. And even during my very latter days, I was still afraid to die because that is human nature. So if somebody wants to kill themselves by committing a horrible crime, they basically leave themselves with no choice but to kill themselves. And better yet, they want the cop to do the job for them. Suicide by cops is very real, and it's actually the real reason behind all of those massacres and gun violence where the government ended up dead, either by suicide or by the cops. And why would they target schools? Because when you are at the end of your rope, you're actually very jealous of people who have a better life than you. I remember I was just so jealous of my fellow schoolmates who are heading off to university, whose life just started, whereas mine was about to end. So young and happy people often became the targets, not seniors in long-term care facilities. Um, so, okay, moving on. I do have a lot of insight to share about gun violence. And I think at its core, it's a mental health issue. I think if the government were educated about their condition, if they sought treatment, they didn't have to die and other innocent people would not have to die with them. So this came to my day, June the 20th of 2003. That morning I got up and headed to the balcony as the first thing in the morning. I realized that the door was locked and the handle of the balcony door was wrapped around with layers of wires. I tricked my dad and told him that I wanted to get some fresh air outside. I just remember he was so easily tricked. He said that at that moment, his mind was a complete blur. Um, so he, he went to the storage room and he took out a pair of pliers and he started to cut the wires loose. Prior to that point, the balcony door was actually secured by wires. So as soon as the door was open, I saw a chair and I got on the chair and crossed over to the other side of the fence without any hesitations. He was able to catch a little part of my pants and my collar, but he wasn't strong enough to pull me up. And because of that, he broke a knuckle in his hand and he had bruises all over his chest because he was banging so hard against the balcony fence. But I think because of what he did, he changed my position in the air. Instead of falling on my neck, on my head, I landed on my back. And that's how I sustained my spinal cord injury. And that's how I became paralyzed since that day. I landed on a very small pile of soil that was about to plant flowers. And I think that was primary, um, primarily the reason I did not die. And considering falling from the eighth floor. I think because of my, mirac my miraculous survival, I'm now a Christian. Um, and the fact that I really, I can share this story without any negative emotion, um, it's a miracle. It's a, it's a even, it's a, it's an even bigger miracle. Uh, over the years, I have definitely seen God's intervention since that faithful day. And right now I'm over 19 years post-injury. My life has never been more beautiful, and it's all because of what God has done in my life. So I'm really grateful that I wasn't meant to die on that day. Um, yeah, there are just a lot of those miracles and interventions in my life. I couldn't explain it other than the fact that God is real. So however, I wasn't grateful on that day. The last thing I wanted was to end up with a permanent physical disability and use a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Um, I was seen by my psychiatrist on the third day, and he began to put me on a whole bunch of medication for my mental health condition. I think at one point, I have to take about 20 pills a day. The amazing thing was I started to sleep after about three weeks being on the medication. So as the quality of my sleep was restored, as I was able to get more and more sleep each day, I felt like my mental health condition was improving. And no longer having those suicidal feelings as something that was overpowering. 
So by the time I was out of the hospital, I realized that had I been treated in time, had I been medicated in time, I would never have jumped. I would still be able to walk today. So if I knew more, if I knew then what I know now about mental illness, I would be in a very different place right now. This is why it's very important for me to have um, educational seminars like this, because you guys need to know that this is a medical condition that is treatable. If you're, if you're suffering, actively suffering right now, you have to know that this is a very temporary feeling. You need to seek treatment and treatment is effective. So this was me uh, four months post injury. So this was me four months post injury. As you can see, um, I had already put up about 40 pounds in three months. And just because the fact that I wasn't moving and the side effects of, of my medication kicked in, I started to crave for all kinds of food and my parents tried to comfort me so they bought everything I wanted. Um, I couldn't even recognize myself in the mirror. At the time, I really didn't think I could ever overcome the regret of hurting myself permanently. I thought I would never be happy again. Um, I'm also suffering. I was also suffering from the result of my spinal cord injury. It's not, it was not just paralysis, but a spinal cord injury can affect somebody's bowel and bladder function. And also at the time, neuropathic pain was terrible for the first two years. I couldn't even sleep at night just because of how painful my body felt. So there was also the physical aspect of my suicide attempt that was tormenting me. That made things um, even more complicated. So this was me a year post-injury. As you can see, I put on so much weight. The side effects of my medication really boost my appetite and not being able to walk. I couldn't exercise to lose those weights. I was extremely lonely. My dog was my only friend at the time. I love him so much. I miss him so much. Um, I became a new Christian at that time and my faith in God and my um, brothers and sisters in church, they were very helpful. They were my only source of comfort and com companionship. I'm really grateful for their presence even till this day. But when I went back to university, it was just really hard facing people from my high school, people who knew about my past. So I was just extremely ashamed about what happened to me. On top of my mental illness, there was also a lot of physiological, um, sorry. So on top of my mental illness, there was just a lot of those psychological traumas. Uh, sorry. In 2006, in 2006, I was formally diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I was actually misdiagnosed in the beginning. So I was on the wrong medication for three years and that's how my bipolar disorder came back for the second time. So about 60% of people with bipolar disorder are misdiagnosed at the beginning with major depression. Not being on the right medication will trigger another episode. After the right diagnosis, I was placed on this medication for bipolar disorder. However, this medication has so many side effects. Besides the fact that my weight was still out of control, I developed terrible acne. My face was disfigured. And when I went out in the public, kids would actually be very scared to see my face. So, but today, as you can see, I have lost all the weight already and my face are completely clear. So all of those side effects of the medications can be reversed. Um, they, it shouldn't be the reason where, where you don't want to take medication because even though the side effects are terrible, they are, the medication will still useful at putting my symptoms under control. So I would say that don't be discouraged by the side effects of your medication. It's very temporary. The positive side, the positive aspect of taking medication greatly outweighs the side effects. So at the time, I also suffer from unforgiveness and hate against people whom I thought were the reason for my misery. What happened to me right before the onset of my depression constantly came back to haunt me. So I was living in hell because of that. One time I wanted to end my life again. And this time we were living on the 14th floor. I was imagining how to break the window. Um, 
And at that moment, God intervened and he made me see my parents' face. He reminded me just how much my parents were suffering for me, how much they sacrificed for me over the years and how they couldn't live without me. So different from the first time, this time my depression was psychological in nature. It had more to do with my disability, with my regrets, with my hate, uh, with all of those negative and dark energies in my head. Whereas the first time it was very physiological in nature. The first time was impossible to control. So this time I actually had a choice. I could choose to die or I could choose to live. And by this time I became a more responsible person. Uh, I knew that my life doesn't belong to me, just they also belong to my parents. So I choose to wheel away from the window. But this kind of back and forth happened many times. I had many such temptations to end my life. But fortunately, every time, God always intervened in those moments. In 2007, my psychiatrist put me on a new medication for my bipolar disorder. And this medication is actually a primary treatment for epilepsy. The medication is called Epival. And I remember that when I was on this medication for a couple of months, I woke up one day feeling like a completely different person. I couldn't explain why. I just felt like I never experienced my inner state in such a peaceful and happy way. The experience of being human was very different compared to the first 22 years of my life. It was amazing and I never looked back since that day. And so this time I finally know how it feels like to be a mentally healthy person, whereas I never knew it before. I never knew it before my medication was right. So for the next little while, I actually lost a lot of weight um, by swimming. And as my physical health improved, my mental health went up to another level. So mental health is very much a part of our physical health. If you do exercise, if you eat healthier, your mental health, your brain health will also improve at the same time. In 2011, I graduated with a psychology degree from the University of Toronto. Um, even though there were four years, I was very struggling. I don't think I miss very much. I used to think that I miss all the so-called fun stuff uh, like partying, drinking, sex, and all the crazy things people do in their youth. But now I look back, I don't think those things would have been healthy for me. Um, those things could, could not give me actual happiness. Instead, it might make me regret them later on in life. Uh, I'm really grateful that my physical disability actually prevented me from becoming a wild person or a more promiscuous person. My physical disability actually protect me from those temptations that most young people couldn't resist. So I don't think I miss much. Over those past 19 years, I traveled the world in my wheelchair. I did things I never thought would be possible again. I never thought I would ever be happy again, but I think anything is possible with God. Uh, I'm just really, really, really content with my life right now. And I can use my experience as an asset many beautiful things came out of it and it's it's a blessing in disguise so my last message for you guys are mental illness is a treatable medical condition it's an illness without brain just like an illness with other parts of our body taking medication seeking treatment is the most effective way to help improve your condition at least in my case having the right medication and staying on the right medication for life is the key to my mental health maintenance. I have been on this medication called Apival, another medication called Seaquil since 2007, and I will take them gladly for the rest of my life without complaining. Um, secondly, just like an illness with other organs in our body, mental illness takes time to heal. Every time I had a major breakdown, it took at least a year to achieve some level of functional recovery. So you have to set your expectations right. Be patient in suffering and don't give up when the progress seems very slow. But if you don't seek treatment, if you are not medicated, you're not going to get better. Um, lastly, just have a resource to share. I wrote my book, called Leap into the Mind of a Suicide. I think reading this book will give you even a better insight into mental illness and mental health recovery. And there are many details that I don't have time to share today, but you can all read about it in my book. And you can also download a free PDF 
from my website, nancysha.com. Uh, my YouTube channel also has many awareness and educational videos for you to watch and share. That's it. So thank you for having me. And I wish you will recover very soon.